I've had a couple of birthdays uh, since I was here last. Uh, one was a, a red letter birthday. I turned 65 and my wife surprised me with a card and a gift, but the gift was coming in the mail a few days later and so she had um, a picture of the gift. And so I read the card and I unfolded and the picture of the gift and this is what came in the mail a few days later. <clears throat> Can't see that? It says, ask me about Medicare. <laughs> I have arrived. I am on Medicare now. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1. Paul the Apostle writes some amazing words here. Verse 21 of Philippians chapter 1. For to me to live is Christ and to die is when you're on Medicare, you think about that a lot more. <laughs> to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? That's an amazing statement inspired by the Spirit. And I have to accept that God's giving him a choice at this time in his life. You want to stay or you want to come home? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. But what we want to hone in on is the statement that he makes. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. In Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus meets Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Saul would become the Apostle Paul, the man penning Philippians chapter 1. God tells him ahead of time when he becomes a Christian how much he's going to have to suffer for the name of Christ. We know God's word was true there because 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul uh, just kind of summarizes some of the things that he has had to suffer for his faith. Um, I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. This guy's got scars all over his body. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. And he just goes on. And you look at the list and you go, I don't know if I want to meet Paul for the first thousand years of heaven because this dude was worth his salt. I'm telling you. He suffered. Now I understand why somebody like the Apostle Paul would write in places like Philippians chapter 1, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. It'd be better by far to be with Christ because... <laughs> His life was filled with pain because of his faith. But here's what he writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I was at the volunteers meeting at 830 and Pastor Joe, as he was sharing, mentioned that someone here named Hannah just got engaged. <laughs> Evidently, you know Hannah. And I forget the guy she got engaged to, and, and now they're moving toward hopefully, 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 marital bliss. I wonder if Hannah and her fiance, if you know what the rapture of the church is, the rapture of the church, you hear the trumpet, Jesus calls us home, you know, it's going to happen. could happen any time. What if it happens before Hannah gets married? Is she going to fill out a complaint form in heaven? You didn't allow me to get married first. I've been married for 38 plus years, most of them happy. Please understand, I, I'm, Hannah, I'm, I'm happy for you, but, but marriage ain't all, it ain't all it's cracked up to be, I'm telling you. It's just, it. Paul said, I'd, I'd like you to remain single. Uh, I want to spare you a lot, of, a lot of concern in this life. Marriage is a good gift, but it's a challenging one. And it, 
I lost you, didn't I? <laughs> Reasons why Christians don't want to go to heaven. I thought of three. Now, you may have more, but they have it too good here. One of my missions pastors years ago spent many years in the Sudan as a missionary because of health reasons, had to come back to America, ended up coming to our church. We ended up hiring him, making him, making him our missions pastor. But he told me uh, terrible stories in Sudan, and yet it was, a, it, it was something that God had called him to. And he said after he got to America, you know, and he's an Irish guy, so he grew up in Ireland and spent 30-some years in Sudan doing missions work, and then he comes on our staff, and he would say often to me, bro, in his Irish accent, we live in luxury here. Sometimes we don't want to go to heaven right now because it's too good here. There's a second reason I thought of. We're afraid of not experiencing fulfillment through some experience in this life. You want to get married first. And there's a third. And that's what we're going to kind of land on and talk about for the few minutes I have here with you. It's a misconception a misconception of what heaven is like. I think there's a misconception in a lot of the church about what heaven is like. A guy named Randy Alcorn wrote a book a few years ago called Heaven. I think it's a great book. I think he said some things straight. Let me read you one statement he makes. I've spoken about heaven at churches and conferences. I've written about heaven and taught a seminary course entitled A Theology of Heaven. There's a great deal I don't know, but one thing I do know is what people think about heaven. And frankly, I'm alarmed. Another guy named John Eldridge wrote a book called The Journey of Desire, and he says nearly every Christian I've spoken with has some idea that heaven is an unending church service. Could I pause there a minute, look me straight in the eye, let me look at you straight in the eye and say if heaven is an unending church service, I don't want to go. <laughs> and I'm a pastor. We have settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky. One great hymn after another, forever and ever, amen. And our heart sinks. Forever and ever, that's it. That's the good news. And then we sigh and feel guilty. We feel guilty that we're not more spiritual. We lose heart. We turn once more to the present, find life we can here. Those of you on Medicare uh, remember a guy named Gary Larson, perhaps. He used to do cartoons called Far Side Cartoons. In it once, he captured this misconception of heaven. It's a man with angel wings and a halo, and he's sitting on a cloud. He's doing nothing with no one nearby. He has an expression someone, of someone marooned on a desert island with absolutely nothing to do. And the caption shows his inner thoughts. And the caption reads, wish I'd brought a magazine. Someone said Satan need not convince us that heaven does not exist. He need only convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. If we believe that lie, we'll be robbed of our joy and anticipation and we'll set our minds on this life and not the next. I love music. Before I became a Christian, I dreamed of being a rock and roll star. Thought I would become one one day. When you do as many drugs as I did in those days, you dream a lot of things that aren't reality. <laughs> I got gloriously saved when I was 19 years old, but I still love music. I even love some secular music. I love the Beatles. Sorry. John Lennon wrote a song years ago called Imagine. Here's some of the lines in the song, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. And no religion, too. Imagine all the people living in peace. Imagine all the people sharing all the world, a brotherhood of man. I love some of John Lennon's music, but his theology was messed up. And if you know about the end of his life, he spent lots of time and lots of money trying to bring peace to the earth. It was a great vision, but his theology is all wrong. Someone said this, it's not an elimination of what is familiar to us, but rather a transformation to a perfect state. I live near Orlando, Florida, the Magic Kingdom. Anybody ever been to Disney World? 
to step through the portals of Disneyland or Disney World, Walt Disney said, will be like entering another world. Disney's Imagineers worked to bring the most awe-inspiring new worlds to life. Walt went to great lengths and spared no expense in an attempt to achieve his dreams. There are no trash trucks that you see as you walk around the Magic Kingdom. Why? Because there's a, another world underneath the Magic Kingdom to try to make what you experience in the Magic Kingdom magical. And all the trash goes there. I'll bet you something else you never thought of. But you're going to think of it next time you go to Disney World. Ever been bitten by a mosquito at Disney World? What a question to ask. I've been to Disney World many times over the years. I don't recall ever being bitten by a mosquito. Why not? It's built on swamp land. Please don't go to sleep. Listen. Disney World is in Florida, after all, a hot state filled with swamps. In fact, the area where the park is located used to be nothing but swamp land. So why are there no mosquitoes at Disney World? Most of Disney World's pest control methods trace back to one man. If you've taken the ferry from the Ticket and Transportation Center to the Magic Kingdom, you may have noticed the name General Joe Potter on one of the boats. MIT graduate and engineering expert, Major General William Joe Potter, met Walt Disney during the 1964 World's Fair. Potter had previously served as governor of the Panama Canal Zone, an area ravaged by malaria-carrying mosquitoes. This is where Potter developed his extensive knowledge of pest control as one of the engineers fighting to control the swarms there. As Joe and Walt talked at the World's Fair, the former governor mentioned his background in controlling mosquitoes. Walt hired him on the spot and put him in charge of keeping mosquitoes out of the expansive theme park he was building in central Florida. Disney's methods aren't to kill bugs, but rather to prevent bugs from being in the park at all. Their methods target the larva by making the park a non-ideal environment for mosquitoes to live or lay their eggs. One of the ways they accomplish this is by making sure the park has no standing water because mosquitoes are attracted to still water, and it's an ideal environment for them to lay eggs. Potter got to work on construction for Disney World, and he immediately set out building drainage ditches to remove all the water, converting the swampy land to buildable land. And those ditches, now named Joe's Ditches, are still used today to keep all the water in Disney parks constantly moving. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> I'm meditating on all this, building up the notes for this message. And as I began to meditate on what heaven is going to be like, I wrote something that you have the unfortunate privilege of hearing because you came to church today. And it goes like this. A new day is dawning for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. A forever world where there's no longer death, mourning, crying, or pain. There are no accidents, ambulances, firemen, doctors, hospitals, assisted living facilities, undertakers, funerals, funeral homes, or cemeteries. There are no retarded, crippled, maimed, blind, or bruised. There's no bug spray. Antiseptics, antibiotics, aspirin, Excedrin, Advil, Motrin, Visine, no sunscreen, no band-aids, bandages, or blood. There are no cavities, root canals, braces, dentures, dentists, or Novocaine shots. Can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> there are no counselors, psychologists, therapists, or mental institutions. There's no police, FBI, CIA, DEA, DIA, ATF. There's no Office of Homeland Security. There's no secret service agency. There's no IRS. 
There are no terrorist bombs, bullets, or war. No political parties or elections. No human trafficking, pornography, prostitution, strip clubs, drug addicts, alcoholics, or homeless shelters. There's no cursing, swearing, or obscene language. There's no misunderstanding. There are no ill feelings, fights, divorces, lawyers, or courts. There's no pollution. There's no rust, decay, moss, or mosquitoes. There's no fear, doubt, worry, or perplexity. Hey, Florida, there's no hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, or floods. There's no cold or heat. There's no aging diets, facelifts, fat, skinny, ugly, no Medicare. There are no struggles, temptations, sin, devil, or demons. There's no sadness, depression, doubts, disappointments, or bad days. If I summed up heaven in three words and look, and we could be here for weeks and talk about the biblical heaven. Let me bring it down to three things. Number one, it's a place of unsurpassed glory. In Isaiah 65, 17, this verse describes the world that God is going to one day create. And it says that the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Someone suggested that means our memory will be wiped out. What a foolish statement. What a wrong statement. If, you're, if your memory is wiped out, you don't remember you came from the previous world. You don't remember how you got to the new one. And so you don't even know Jesus is your Savior. Come on. No, no, no. It's not because your memory is wiped out. One day it finally dawned on me what's, what's going to happen in that coming day. If you know what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus says to his disciples, some of you won't taste death until you see the kingdom of God come in all its glory. And then he takes Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain, and there he's transfigured before them. And they see him in his glory. And they experience that glorious moment. And Peter, Peter, don't you love Peter? Peter says, let's just build three houses. Let's move here. Let's just stay here. Peter forgot the wife. He forgot the family. Forget everything else down in the valley. Let's just live here. What was happening in that moment of glory? Here's what was happening. It was so glorious, he forgot everything else down in the valley. My wife and I just came back from the longest vacation we've ever taken. Had the privilege of being with Pastor Malcolm Wilde, if you know that name, and his wife and some of his family, and they invited us, and we all went on a cruise together to the Greek islands. We were on the ship for over 14 days. I've never been on a ship that long. But for me, for me, after five days, even the people with me says I began to decompress. They could see it. I began to whew, settle in and rest. And that ship became home. And guess what happened during that cruise on the Greek Isles? There were moments where I totally forgot all the problems that were waiting on me once I got back home. Because... There were moments so glorious. You're not going to forget. You're not going to have your memory wiped out. It's going to be so glorious. Second, David writes in Psalm 1611, You'll fill me with joy in your presence with pleasures eternal, eternal pleasures at your right hand. Imagine Living in a world, you'll never have a day where you go, what am I going to do today? I'm so bored. No, eternal pleasures. They're never going to end. Every day is going to be filled with pleasure. And the pleasures just get better and better and better and better and better and better forever and ever and ever. <laughs> it's a place of unsurpassed glory. It's a place of unending eternal pleasure. But the one I like the best, as I bring it to the third point and conclude and summarize the whole thing. <laughs> Jesus hanging on the cross, thief on the right, thief on the left. They're insulting and mocking him. But over a period of time, one of them has a change of heart. 
And the Holy Spirit is able to bring conviction to this thief in his soul. And he turns to Jesus and he says these simple words, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I get Jesus bumps every time I think about what Jesus turned and said to this thief. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Have you read this thing? In the book of beginnings, that's where it began. God created the first man, gave him the most beautiful woman in all the world. She's the only woman in all the world. But still, he looked at her. How did how'd she call a woman? He, Adam looked at her and said, whoa, man. <laughs> and guess what? I'm not trying to be off color. Come on. I don't want to, look, we're mostly adults in here, but I think that even those that are younger can handle it. They're naked. They're naked. And they're in paradise. And they got God. And they got all the animals. And they got paradise. That's where it began. Guess where it's going to end? Naked? Come on. What's the illustration there? And what's the, what, is, what is represented there in the husband and wife relationship and the holy matrimony and living together in eternal bliss in paradise? What is it? It's the eternal bridegroom. It's the eternal bride. Jesus is the eternal bridegroom and those who say yes to him are the eternal bride. That means that heaven is going to be met Heaven's going to be better than even your best married life. Heaven's going to be better than the intimacy enjoyed in holy matrimony. Heaven's going to be better. As a man, I have to take that by faith. Because I love my wife. And I can't imagine a day... Jesus said in heaven, they'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. Well, as a 100% full-blooded man, I go, well, come on. I won't get intimacy with my bride any longer. It's going to be better. As I'm working this thing up, I talked to my wife about it, and I said, I'm going to do a T-shirt. Heaven is better than, and I was going to use the three-letter word for holy matrimony and what's enjoyed in holy matrimony. And she said, you can't do that. You can't do a T-shirt like that, especially and wear it in church. So because I'm married, I couldn't do that T-shirt. Well, I brought it up in staff meeting. I said, my wife says I can't do this shirt. She said, they said, you're right. You can't do that shirt. And I'm putting it in trust. So come on, man, because it, it's true. I'm not trying to be off color. I mean, God created it, didn't he? Didn't he? God created it. And so right after this discussion, we just happened to be having a, a get together for our staff. And we're having these little elephant exchange gift thing. You've been to those, you know, and we had a limit on how much we could spend. And you had to draw one of the staff members and you had to buy a gift for them. And so a guy used to be with Joe Foch, Calvary Chapel Philly for 11 years, moved to Florida with his wife. We hired him. And uh, now he's one of our pastors on staff. And he drew my name and he has to buy me a gift. And guess what he bought me? A T-shirt. And here's the T-shirt. <laughs> Heaven is better than, and he just put a blank there. I'm like, that's perfect. That's perfect. And so I don't have to do the T-shirt because my wife said I couldn't. I'll just do this T-shirt. <laughs> and Pastor Tony gave me this T-shirt, and now here's the deal. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what you put in the blank. Yep, that's right. It doesn't matter. You can put anything in the blank. And it's still a true statement. Heaven is better than anything you put in the blank. They told me I got to shut up by noon. That means I got nine minutes. Why should I think about heaven? Two final reasons, two final thoughts. Because it's motive for life now. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy 
the pleasures of sin for a short time. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world and let you lose your soul? We fix our eyes on what is not seen, not on what is seen. Jonathan Edwards was a great Puritan preacher, and he often spoke of heaven. In his early 20s, he composed a set of life resolutions. One read, resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can. C.S. Lewis said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, but it's a challenge. Because so many things in this life tend to get my focus here. I've even gotten off track as a Christian. I've gotten off track as a pastor. A few years ago, I had a love affair with beer and wine. You want to be honest? That's honesty. But I repented, and I got back on track. Lost my focus for a while. Lost my motive for living. And I began to live for now instead of the world to come. It's motive for life now. And last but not least, but just listen, listen to me. <laughs> it's hope. It's hope. It's hope. No matter how hopeless your situation in life might become. Paul said our present sufferings aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. There's hope. There's always hope. My purpose is not to tell my stories, but I've been through some. I haven't been the Apostle Paul. Man, you look at his list and you go, wow. But I've been through some very difficult times. If only in this life we have hope, we're of all men to be most pitied. It was 1952. A woman named Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island, California, determined to swim to the shore of mainland California. She'd already been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. Weather was foggy, chilly. She could hardly see the boats accompanying her. She swam for 15 hours, and then she begged to be taken out of the water. Her mother in a boat alongside told her she was close and she could make it. But finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and she was pulled out. It wasn't until she was on the boat that she discovered the shore was less than a mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. If I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. 